Hi again. Please, one second. Hi, we'll start the second lecture. We'll be presenting uh, Patrick. He is from uh, Yahoo Labs Haifa. And he will be speaking about data, data modeling in uh, Spark. And uh, I'll give him the stage here. Thanks. Thank you, Danny. Um, yeah, so welcome, everyone. Uh, I'd like to talk about logistic regression. So after the previous talk has pretty much trashed uh, deep learn uh, logistic regression. Advertised uh, deep learning. I also want to tell you why maybe you still want to use uh, logistic regression, and uh, also tell you how to use this uh, in Spark, in Patch Spark. All right. Um, so who are we? Uh, we're the, the upper part of that slide, and uh, it's a research group in in Haifa. Uh, it's led by Michal. And uh, we also have, a, on this project specifically, we have a collaborator in the US in California. Um, OK, so what do we do? Uh, Asaf has already talked about that. We essentially, our group focuses on ad ranking methods uh, on Yahoo, uh, all, all over Yahoo. Uh, one of the things, oops, go back. So essentially here you can see an example, native ad on some mobile, almost a bar bar. Um, yeah, <laughs> or for us also in the stream. And what we do is, is mostly power the, the science behind these algorithms and uh, the, the ranking algorithms specifically. Um, so ad ranking overview. Um, to those not familiar with the topic, essentially it's, you have advertisers uh, an advertiser can run different campaigns, and each campaign might have different ads. So they might choose to have to run one campaign with different ads, uh, optimized for different uh, people and target different. Um, now each ad has a has a bit, which is set by by the, by the advertiser, and you you have different ad price types in the market. So maybe uh, an advertiser wants to pay per view. So that's, that's mostly if he wants to, to um, let's say, uh, sort of the classic display ad, or pay per click if, if they really care about clicks, or what's definitely also important is uh, various conversion types. So where the, the advertiser really says, I care about a user arriving or signing up for a newsletter, or uh, buying a product, something like that. Now, for every impression on on a Yahoo properties uh, or Yahoo property that has Gemini native enabled, essentially we run an auction with, with all the possible eligible ads. So there's some filtering going on here. You have targeting, you have budget. So so uh, ads might run out of budget. So they, they're not eligible anymore. A uh, user might not be in the target group. So maybe a, an ad only wants to advertise for males. Um, so there's some filtering going on. But once that's out of the picture, essentially you have a set of eligible ads. And uh, we, as Yahoo, we want to maximize the, the profit, the revenue. So by large, we, we want to give the ad to the, or to the impression of an of a give an impression and add sort of the map, we want to do it for, for the ads that uh, has the highest expected revenue. Now, for this, we actually need to know a, what's, what's known as the CTR of an ad, or predicted CTR. That's the personalized probability of a click. What's the probability that a given user would actually press on, a, on an ad? Um, so just to to illustrate that, why do we care about the click probability? So you, let's say you have two ads in the system. Um, and now we have a, ad number one has $1 as a, as a bid for a click. Ad number two has, has a $2 for, for a click. Um, now, only knowing this, I guess you would choose to, to actually give the impression to or, display this ad for, for that impression, right? But uh, let's say now we have uh, some average older user 
it's much more likely to, to actually click on this nice ad with Barra Fele in it. So let's see, let's say he clicks on this with 5% probability on the other one, only one with 1%. So the expected revenue for this ad is actually 5 cent versus for this one it's 2 cent. So essentially Yahoo would, would pick this ad rather than the other one. Now, click-through rate prediction, uh, it just given a user context, predict the probability of click. I would claim it's probably one of the most profitable machine learning problems in, uh, in industry. Um, and it's surprisingly simple. So you have just a binary prediction problem. Uh, one thing that's a bit different is that you care about the probabilities rather than just the labels, which is sometimes the case. Um, it's it's a very it's a very skewed label distribution. So the skips, most of the impressions are actually skips. Most people don't click on ads. Um, we, as the AppSolver talk already showed, we have a lot of data, like uh, tons of data. Often subsampling is done um, to actually handle the data. And essentially, every impression on a Yahoo enabled. Or, a Yahoo uh, page essentially generates a training example. So you would get billions of, of examples a day. And uh, what's also important is you have limits, limitations at serving. So we need to predict very quickly. And moreover, in training, maybe you only see one impression, one ad, but at, at uh, predict time, you actually need to rank <laughs> all the ads in the system. So essentially, for every ad, you need to compute its uh, click problem. Now, the basic setting from a research point of view is, is pretty well understood. There's quite a few papers on it, like Google has a paper, Facebook has a paper, paper Yahoo has a few papers on it, and the, the most challenging part of it is really the scale, like uh, loads of data. And, and there's some more interesting research topics that I'm not gonna go into this time. Uh, it's, it's more about how do you sort of explore new ads. Um, how do you deal with always displaying ads that have been around for a while, where you sort of know what to get, and new ads where you don't know so much uh, what's their CTR. Um, and also learning from log feedback, it's not so clear. Now, uh, just a brief overview, essentially about uh, CTR prediction in Gemini Native. We have a collaborative filtering approach that is running in production. It's uh, implemented in Hadoop on top, uh, or on top of Hadoop MapReduce, and that's used in um, Gemini native ad ranking. Now, what I'm actually going to talk about today, it's, it's a large-scale logistic regression approach uh, implemented on top of Spark. Um, what, what I personally think is really nice about it is that uh, Spark and Scala um, allow us to really quickly iterate and uh, sort of debug and uh, find new models, uh, which is not so much possible in, in the older approach. And, but it also incorporates a lot of uh, concept of the collaborative filtering approach um, in the launch stage, which is the progression. Okay. Now, how would we go about implementing such a large-scale logistic regression model in Spark? Um, first, what's Spark? Uh, who actually knows about oh, <laughs> who knows about Spark? Most people here. That's great. So I can probably skip this slide. Um, yeah, you can think of it similar to Hadoop, just much much better in my opinion. Um, probably the the most amazing thing about it is that you can cache data, um, so you can. It's great for iterative uh, workflows, so you can go several times over the data without the serialization overhead. Um, it contains a lot of syntactic sugar, sugar filter, reduce by key, this thing, sort by key, join. It's all implemented directly in Spark. Um, then. The Spark shell is really nice. Uh, it allows you to, to have sort of an interactive way to, to <laughs> interact with, with the system. And last but not least, 
uh, for data scientists coming from R and Python, um, the new functionality of data frames is quite useful. All right. um, it also includes modules for machine learning, streaming, graph computation, and SQL data frames. And these are all sort of projects or things that also exist in the Hadoop ecosystem, but usually it's a separate project. Here it's all one ecosystem. Um, so what do we use at uh, Yahoo? We use the latest ver version of Spark. It's, uh, who knows about Yarn, Mesos, I think there's a, so essentially we use Yarn as a resource manager for running Hadoop, on, uh, the Spark on top. Uh, at Yahoo, most of the data is stored in some format on top of HDFS. And uh, so essentially the different teams within Yahoo don't need to manage their own clusters. That's all centrally managed. And it's really nice. I mean, uh, tons of, of clusters and, and uh, nodes available. Um, great. So now, um, the yep, so we talk already talked a bit about uh, streaming versus uh, how to prepare data. Um, so I just want to briefly touch on that and uh, discuss how one would go about implementing something like that, sort of the, the joining of the data in, in Spark. So let's say we, I mean, we have billions of, of ad impressions daily. Um, you can't really think of, if you want to do some learning, you, you don't have this classic machine learning setting where you have a training data set and then a test data set where you train on the training data set, <coughs> just predict on the test data set. This doesn't work. Um, so what people often do is, is sort of a batch streaming. Every few minutes, let's say here it's 15 minutes, but you might choose a different interval. Um, you have sort of a stream of impressions um, and you have a stream of clicks. So the impressions, every time serving displays an ad, you would see an impression in the logs. Same for clicks. So every time somebody clicks on, a, on an ad, you would see it in the click stream. Was there a question? No. no. Okay. Um, so now let's say, how do we, so for, for learning essentially we need, for every impression we need whether it was a click or a skip. So what's, what's usually done is you, you take the clicks from one time step or time interval and maybe the clicks from, from the next time interval. So clicks are usually quick. I mean, conversions, you would actually need to wait much longer. So you, you sort of want to give it enough time that somebody would actually click on an ad. Um, but of course, this increases sort of the delay of the whole system. So you, don't, you want to make this long enough so that you get most of the clicks, but not too long. Otherwise, you, 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 um, you accumulate delay. So um, essentially, then we would, would take the impressions from, from this time interval the, and the clicks from both and see which impressions actually have a click. And this produces the, the labeled demands for this time interval. You do the same for the next one, where you take the impressions from this time interval and the clicks of these two. Now, uh, just to give a, an idea of how one would go about implementing this in Spark, you have, uh, let's say, the impressions is a RDD of, uh, of the actual impressions. What's up? Uh, sorry, it's a resilient distributed data store. And it's Spark's abstraction of text data. And it's not a stream, it's a, it's, it's a collection. It's a collection. You're, think of it as an array that is just distributed over, over many nodes. Um, I mean, there the, are the streams on top of that, but let's assume so here. That's, a, that's like a best that you showed with the slide? Yes, like the um, exactly. This would be, you would have the yes. impressions would be just this batch, okay. and clicks would actually already be the union of two of those. So let's say, we also have a, so essentially we, we just take these impressions and we create a, um, a uh, well, sort of a triple of the join key. Let's say each impression has a, or each event in the system has actually a, a uh, some key or some semi-unique key. 
and you would just create the tuple of the actual information and I for impression, let's say. Um, you do the same for the clicks, join key. Here you actually use a C for the clicks because it's a click stream. And again, the E is just the, the old information that you might have of that email. Now, uh, how would you actually, so essentially then you would just take the impressions, do a union with the, with the clicks. So this gives you now all the data together. Now, what you do is reduce by key with this function. Well, we'll get to that. Um, but essentially, this would then just pr produce you a um, bunch of data with uh, either, if you see a CI, you know it's, if I've seen a click and an impression. So it, I would actually create a labeled event with a click. If I only see an I, then I would um, predict a zero, or have a zero, actually a skip. And C is a sort of a strange case which should never happen. I've seen only a click, but no impression. But let's say we, we ignore those. So what does the, the smart combine do? It's essentially reduced by key. We'll just uh, apply a function on um, data points that have the same key. So here you specify the, the function that is applied on data points with the same key. And essentially the whole idea is that we, we join or do a join essentially. So what do we do here? Is essentially if if the first event and the second event both are a click, we can only keep keep one of those. I mean we don't care about I mean it might happen that we have just so happened that we log a click twice. Um, so this would just essentially ignore one. Same for impressions. If you have two impressions with the same key, just ignore one of them at random. I mean, here we choose the first one. Um, now, the, the more interesting case is that uh, we have a click and an impression. So here we now actually change from uh, CI, from click and impression. We, we just store, we actually have seen both of them. And uh, if, if it's the other way, the first one is an impression, the other one is a click, we, we can store CI. Um, so essentially, this would really take care of, of the whole join logic using a reduce like it gives you sort of a, an idea of how how, to, how would one go about implementing something like that. Yes? Can you explain how this how you get a tuple of two events from the reduce by keys? Okay, so reduce by key the way it works is uh, it, it takes uh, it applies this function on on uh, two items that have the same key. So the key would be what you, you have here. Oh, they, they already come with some kind of like a, like a unique, unique idea. Yes, exactly. Some, some unique idea. Okay. And then uh, it, essentially the reduce by key is only applied on those. The key you already know is the same. Right. Yes? General question. There is some advantages to use Scala with Depends whom you ask, I suppose. I mean, I prefer Scala, but. Uh, Python is also great. I mean, I, I guess Scala is really a first-class citizen of Spark. I mean, most of it is implemented in, in Scala. Um, whereas with Python, you always have sort of a... It's mostly uh, performance-wise. Yeah, some overhead. Um, OK, so now how would you go about incrementally learning a, a model? So I explained already you have sort of in the time interval impressions, clicks, we take the clicks also from the next interval to create labeled events. And now we can actually do some machine learning on top of that. So we, I'm not going to talk about this much, but you would now from these labeled events, you would extract some features and then get what I would call learning examples. And, and then the actual learning would help happen with, on these learning, uh, on these examples together with the, the old model. So you, you, with every 15 minutes, in this case, train a model using the, the previous model. You update the previous model with the latest uh, data. How long does it take to train the model? Um, if it, yeah, every 15 minutes, you do that. Yeah, I mean, less than 15 <laughs> minutes. Um, 
it depends on how complex the model is and uh, how... No, the, actually the threshold of 15 minutes is because of the limit of how much does the process take or it's because like some magical number you found? Um, in our case it's just the way it's locked. Mm -hmm. So data is locked every 15 minutes. And, uh, that's the mm -hmm. frequency. Um, but for example if you have a streaming architecture where it really comes in that there's no principle the reason why you would want to have 15 mm -hmm. minutes. Um, any other questions? I mean, I, I like it to be interactive, so if you have questions, please ask. Okay. Um, so that's that's sort of the general overview. Um, you, train, huh? you, you actually train the model every 15 minutes? In this setting, yes. What's the advantage of training every 15 minutes? Like, what is your data set changing so quickly? I mean, in our case, we have uh, advertisers that come and go all the time. So, you, you, uh, well, leaving, leaving advertisers is not a big problem, but uh, new ads in the system, you want to serve them as quickly as possible. Because the more ads you have in the system, sort of, the better the market. So, it's somewhat important to. But it's mostly on the quickly. advertiser side and not on the user base side. Yes, users you have much less control over. Yes. You just discount the old models or you do? No, no, you, you want to increment. I mean, essentially, you don't want to throw away the old model, but slowly over time adapt to new data. I mean, what what's the previous talk mentioned as trending, sort of, you you want to adapt to, to more recent trends. Yes, you initialize, but, uh, you initialize from the previous model, or just yes, you combine can. the book I mean, what do you mean by initialize and combine? You use the, the, the previous model's ways for the logistic regression, or you... I mean, I don't, no, no, I mean, if you do it that way, it's, it wouldn't work so well. So you, we'll get to that point, yeah. otherwise we can talk about it later. Um, so uh, I would say logistic regression is still one of the industry standards uh, to do ads ranking and uh, click-through rate prediction. Um, that's, for example, the Google paper, there's also Facebook paper. Um, and it's it's essentially very simple. I mean, you have a, the probability of, of a click given a context, and net is just uh, what's called the sigmoid of uh, of sort of an inner product. And so here you have two parts. You have a weight vector and you have a, a feature vector. So the feature vector is you can do any nonlinearity in there. I mean, the, the, in the vector itself, you can can encode anything you possibly would want to encode. So that's why I don't agree with the previous talk exactly on uh, what's possible and what's not possible. Because if you have non-linearities in, in the actual feature encoding, then it's there. You can learn that. It, it, what's magical in some way about deep learning is that hopefully you should find this interactions on its own. But if you encode it in the feature, vector in some sense, right from the start, it's there. Um, so now, I would say most of the model expressive, expressiveness is uh, controlled through these features. I mean, there's a lot of things you can optimize on learning and stuff, but uh, in the end of the, uh, the day, it really boils down uh, what you encode in these features. And that's why deep learning is possibly a good alternative, because they don't have to pre-specify everything. Um, and so what I, what I, I'm not sure I mentioned it, but it's, it's usually very high dimensional, millions, possibly billions, uh, but most of the, the elements are, are non zero or are zero. So you only, that's illustrated here, you have a vector with only very few components that are actually non zero The model parameters on the other hand, they need to be learned, and uh, most of them are actually zero. Uh, not so. But that's a dense vector, this is sparse. Now, features for logistic regression, I mean, I'm not going to go into detail what we do, uh, but essentially you can think of it. I mean, you have one hot encoding for age, gender, browser, device ID, anything that, that you actually have about the user, the context, uh, the ad, you can put them in. Now, what one usually has to do is, is sort of build these crosses, uh, 
and sort of the uh, intersection of both. So here is an example. Is I have a feature of gender and age. So this would be male and 30. Um, you would have gender and section. So section is a, uh, a different uh, display, different uh, context. It could be display. Um, a device, let's say Windows NT. I don't know. Now, this is usually represented not by sort of the classic numerical index in, a, in, a, in sort of linear algebra, the sparse vector is usually represented by a linear uh, numeric index and the value. Here you would usually use the, the actual, like something like that as the key. And, and now this, this doesn't really correspond to a, to a fixed length vector. So what you usually do is, is you hash these, um, these values to get to a fixed uh, index in a vector. So you pre-specify what's the uh, what's the maximum length or the maximum dimension of the vector, and then you just hash to actually get to the index for a specific uh, sort of uh, string index, going from a string index to, a, to an actual numeric index. But one has to be very careful, because of course this introduces collisions. Uh, so you want to have a high enough dimensionality. To, you don't have too many collisions, but low enough so that you can still learn that. Yes? So you said that most of them are handcrafted. There are also uh, other techniques that, uh, that, that learn these uh, transformations. So I mean, of course you can, can repeat have... the question? Ah, so to repeat the question is, uh, can we think of an automated way to come up with these features? Um, I mean, you can sort of use this as a black box, and of course, on the outside, sort of just think of this of, of, of this as a learner, and then create on the outside different configurations. And actually, a lot of our work is, is sort of on how how to come up with better features. And um, but I would say, by large parts, it's still um, somewhat handcrafted. Um, but at the end of the day, there's also I mean, with these approaches, um, often you can just add as much as you want, as many interactions as you want. Um, of course, runtime is an issue, but um, I mean, you can sort of throw away some interactions when you see the weights are all zero or something like that. Now, the last part is about uh, the parameter estimation. Oops. So. Um, the basic problem is just called the regularized maximum workload. You want to find the W that sort of minimizes a uh, training data part, or the, the loss on the training data, plus the regularizer. So the regularizer prevents overfitting, and that's why you do it. Now, um, I mentioned before that this vector is very dense, and uh, actually there are approaches that um, replace this, here it's a L2 regularization, sometimes you actually use L1 regularization, most people do it, because this actually makes the vector sparse. Uh, or in the ideal case, it makes it sparse. Um, so uh, why is sparseness important? Because at the predict time, for all the ads that you rank, you actually need to store this vector in memory, and uh, the fewer non-zero elements you have here, the faster it gets. So it's not so much only a learning problem, but it's also at, at predict time. Yes? No, no, I mean, the, the example, uh, so, so here we use pairs of features, uh, so the question is why is it only pairs but not uh, triplets? I mean, that's just an example. I mean, the, the tuple here is, is about the the, sort of the, the index. And the index would always be a, a tuple, but the, the actual value can be a symbol. Okay. Now, okay, so most people actually don't use L1 here, uh, L2, but L1 uh, to, to get the sparse vector. Um, 
Now, this, what I wrote here is, is essentially a batch setting. So you remember, I, every 15 minutes, I want to retrain them all. So if, if I would just forget about all the, the previous uh, models, I, I could just train this every 15 minutes. But that wouldn't work so well, because then I completely forget about any data that I had before. So usually, you, you actually want to perform sort of an incremental model update and not start from scratch, which, which this equation would actually apply. So uh, what this Google paper, for example, um, proposes is to, to follow the regularized leader. Um, it's sort of a sequential online le learning algorithm. We had one question about parallelizing these algorithms. Um, essentially, most of these uh, stochastic gradient and all variants of them, they're inherently uh, sequential. Sort of. It's not so easy to parallelize them. I'll, I'll briefly talk about how one could actually parallelize, follow the regularized leader. But um, yeah, not too much detail about that. Um, you can think of it pretty much as stochastic gradient descent was already discussed before. It just has a few nice features. Um, it has, for example, a per-coordinate learning rate. Um, so if, if the features are very like, skewed in some way, this does much better. It, uh, because it incorporates an L1 term, it actually encourages sparseness. And uh, essentially, it doesn't only store the weights, but it stores uh, sort of an accumulated gradient per-coordinate. So yes, essentially, don't only store one vector, but actually two vectors. Um, now, I don't want to go into the details of follow the regularized leader, but I want to go into how one would actually implement this in parallel. So um, let's say we have a, an RDD of learning examples. I'm not going to go into how the like essentially, learning example is just you can think of it as a vector plus a label. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, let's say we would would have these examples. So let's say we we also have a variable number of workers. So, so this sort of controls the parallelism. I mean, initially this RDD might not be, I mean, might be stored in three hundred machines, but uh, the parallelism of the actual learning you might only want to have ten. Whatever. Like, uh, essentially, the, the fewer, the smaller the parallelism, the, the more accurate the learning is going to be, because you're going to introduce some approximations in the learning. Um, and essentially, what's quite convenient in, in Spark is the MAC partitions. It allows you to, to operate on a whole partition. Um, and essentially, what you can do is just in using MAC partitions, compute um, sort of a, an update. Uh, on each of the of the partitions individually, and then use three reduce to actually uh, average the, the deltas, and or essentially accumulate them and average them in in the last step. The update partitions. I think I'm running out of time, but uh, essentially, you could. This is now a, a sequence or a um, essentially. It's just. Uh, a sequential algorithm. So this is on one machine. Mac partitions only runs on one machine. So here you can implement a uh, standard FTRL code with uh, return you some weights, the counts, and here is actually the, the averaging being done. Now, summary logistic regression with Spark. Um, what I found quite nice, it's fairly efficient. Um, so whereas before we used uh, Quite some subsampling here. Essentially, you don't need to do any form of subsampling. Um, you using Spark, essentially, you can do any form of pre, uh, feature pre-processing, like count how many times a feature occurs, things like that. That's much harder in Hadoop because you only go once through the data. Um, Spark Shell allows you to debug things, and last but not least, it's very easy to unit test. I have actually a couple of questions about the environment. Uh, so I'll have some lessons learned, ah, okay. and then maybe no you, you have. Uh, okay. That's why I was rushing. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, first lesson learned is always upgrade. I mean, it's, uh, it's 
pretty much every three year, three months, uh, there's a new uh, release. So uh, I find it beneficial to always upgrade. There might be some pain points while upgrading, but uh, it usually pays off. Um, so bugs get fixed, but also you you sort of actually understand what where the community is going and uh, well, say for example data frames are now being used rather than RDBs in some parts so uh, it's better to understand the trade-offs between those. Um, second one is uh, configurations can be a bit tricky um, what we usually use is sort of a, an approach where we have all the config directories in one folder um, we essentially usually have three types of configurations. One is the login. You can use this uh, find unit using log4j. Um, then you have Spark configs itself. And we also have sort of application configs like of our actual code. Um, and usually we have two versions, like one for local, like local development on your computer, and one on the cluster. So you might have different environments there. That's why you need two types of configs. Um, and essentially for application configs, I find this type safe config. It's a library that allows you to sort of set defaults, but also um, uh, sort of a file to, to overwrite the defaults. Um, yeah, like in general, don't hard code any configurations. And um, accumulators, I find very useful. Um, so usually it's used for ensuring some form of correctness. With big data you cannot really print every time something goes wrong or uh, I mean you, you need something to deal with that. So let's say you have, you have a parser that parses some data and sometimes data is just wrong and it doesn't work so well. So uh, the, the standard way is probably to just skip over that, that line. So but now Maybe all of a sudden the data really changes and you have a problem and all of a sudden you, you, you ignore, I don't know, 10 million lines of code and you wouldn't actually know about it. So um, these accumulators are very useful to catch these type of configurations. So for example, here we have a parser. In the normal case, you would return a scala notation, so a sum. And if something goes wrong, you actually catch the exception, don't do anything and just return none. And uh, in this case, you would now, using the accumulator, just add one to this accumulator, and maybe at the end of the parsing, just print how many uh, lines were failed in some way. Um, then RDD versus data frames. Uh, I mentioned it before, so RDD is sort of basic abstraction in, in Spark, but recently uh, there has been sort of a second type of abstraction, which is called data frame coming from R, and Pandas, and Python. Um, it's, they both have advantages and disadvantages. Like RDDs are type safe, the others are not so type safe. Um, but I think, yeah, pros and cons, and you have to decide a bit what to choose. Um, last but not, or one of the more important things is shuffle and spark can still get you in troubles uh, if so shuffle is essentially every time a lot of data is being sent over the network um, that, I mean, this can get you into troubles so usually data is local on a machine but say reduced by key essentially it, it, it uh, hashes the, the key and sends it to a machine based on, on the hash so there's possibly a lot of uh, sending data on the network going on. So you have to be careful and think a bit about the order of operations. Uh, like, uh, let's say reduce by key on, on, say, domains might not work because some domains are, let's say, mail domains, uh, like mails and domains. Say, facebook.com sends a lot of emails. So if you, if you, if you do a reduce by key based on, on email address uh, domains, then Essentially, there's one machine that gets all the data, which is Facebook.com, and that wouldn't work so well. So you have to be a bit careful. Um, sometimes even reduce can actually lead to prompts if you send really large data. So uh, because this uh, 
tree reduce, which, which should help a bit. So this aggregates things in a tree rather than just one machine. Um, machine learning in Spark, I, I still think it's relatively basic. Um, some algorithms don't scale so well. Um, partially not customizable enough. So you essentially see, for example, optimizers um, that sort of assume a regularizer. And I mean, if you come from machine learning slash optimization, I mean, they shouldn't be mixed one with the other. I mean, there's no reason to mix them. Um, because regularizer is something related to a learning algorithm, whereas uh, the, yeah, so, no need to, to actually include that. Um, so we also had to build our own domain-specific language for feature extraction. Um, and last but not least, the API. I mean, it might actually be implemented in Spark itself, but from externally, you could not access some of the API. Um, so they close it, uh, which is also problematic. Um, but to close on a positive uh, note, what I'm quite excited about this, this uh, transformer estimator pipeline approach in, in, in Spark that's pretty much adopted from SkyKit Learn. Um, it sort of allows you to quickly sort of have pipelines combine different algorithms with one another. Uh, something very recent and quite nice. I think that's the last slide. Uh, thank you very much.